Howdy, Aaron Boster here, and thanks for learning about MS with me, but not just me. Today, I am super excited to be joined by a buddy of mine, Dr. Brandon Bieber. Brandon, howdy. Hey, good to see you this morning. I'm so excited that we got together. I've been doing a lot of these live stream Q and A's and I got a couple questions I thought would be super to discuss with you. Sounds good, let's do it. Jenny McGraw writes, newly diagnosed, your neuro is calling for a low starter med because you have mild case of MS. Should you be concerned? So really I think Jenny's kind of discussing this escalation model concept. Dr. Bieber, you wanna start us off? Yeah, I personally would be concerned about that. Obviously, everyone's situation is different. We can't comment on your own specific situation. But I think there's this general bias in treatment of MS where people look at the person and say, this person doesn't have a lot of disability, hence their MS is mild. But the nature of disease-modifying therapy is such that it's all about prevention. It's kind of like taking an aspirin to prevent a heart attack. So it doesn't really matter what the person's current level of disability is. In fact, there's evidence that these drugs work better in people with low disability. It's more about their potential to have problems later on. So I would say for most people with MS, the evidence is mounting that it's better to be aggressive early on. Now, there could be someone who has optic neuritis, and maybe their worst vision was 2030. They recovered in three days. They have two tiny lesions on their MRI, nothing in the spine. Their spinal tap was positive, hence they meet the modern diagnostic criteria for MS. Yeah, maybe that person is different. But I would say for a lot of people, I would give a different recommendation. I could summarize my thoughts by saying what you said. I wholeheartedly agree. I have coined a, a term I use a lot in clinic. I want you on the most effective medicine that you're comfortable with. And so for each individual, everybody has a different risk aversion. But if you let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend the most effective thing that we can get a hold of. And it's my hope that we can help uh, raise awareness that the earlier application of these medicines, the better people tend to do. Yeah, your point is true that, you know, it's easy for us to pr prescribe medications. It's harder to take them and accept the risk. So ultimately, you have to be comfortable with that, of course. But I also think it's our responsibility to deliver up-to-date uh, information to patients and alert them that there really is a difference in the efficacy of the medicines. It's not like, uh, it's not like seizure medicines where the efficacy of the various anti-epileptics are more or less about the same. Here, not so much. Not at all. Yeah, very different in efficacy. Now, this next question uh, is from Ichabod13, uh, who has been a longtime viewer. I should preface this by saying, this was during a live stream where I was discussing uh, clinical trials and how it's, I think it's unethical to do a placebo controlled trial. So that was the background to this first question. He writes, I know it's unethical to go onto a placebo comparison, but isn't it not a little unethical to take someone willing to do a study for a new and potentially better drug and give them a low efficacy comparator drug. Rebus comes to mind since they're comparing everything off Rebif. Then the numbers look better and you say 75% less relapses, which we know that was you know 50, but points well taken. Yes, that is a good question. I actually did in fact participate in the OPERA trial, Ocrevus versus Rebif for relapsing MS. And so I guess you could call me unethical, you did too. So, and uh, you know, we had used rituximab for a long time within Southern California, Kaiser Permanente. And, you know, we knew the answer before the trial started that Ocrevus was just going to blow away Rebif. However, you know, I wouldn't consider it to be unethical because, you know, Ocrevus also has greater potential to weaken the immune system. So it's not necessarily 100% clear. Now, personally, if I had a patient that I felt needed highly effective medication, then I wouldn't enroll them in that trial. And, then, and that's increasing the proportion of people who would meet that criteria as the evidence mounts. So I think that it's sort of an individual thing. And also, I think you, you really have to have that discussion ethically say, hey, you could get randomized to a lower efficacy medication if in your trial, if you're in this trial, and I do have the option to just give you a stronger medication outside of the trial. So you really have to have that discussion with people. But I wouldn't consider it to be like malpractice to give a lower efficacy medication or anything like that. A lot of people do that. Many of them are safer. You know, there are risks and benefits. I agree. And just to piggyback off what you're saying, the, the thing that stands out to me is the discussion. And we have a very frank discussion where I say, look, we have these options, which are highly efficacious, X, Y, Z. And then I tell them there's this other option for a trial. And the way I try to frame it is to say, look, number one, you never need to do a trial. Please don't feel an obligation to do the trial. 
And we have to be okay with if you're on the comparator, you have to like be all right with that. And we talked through all of that. I think that's a deal breaker for some patients, but I still think there are plenty of patients that are comfortable with the risk benefit and want to fight back. They want to contribute and stick it to the disease. And that's a heck of a good way to do it. I think you're right. As long as you discuss it, it's reasonable. And it's not obviously inappropriate. Uh, there's actually an, on, yeah, there's a, actually an oncology doctor on Twitter, Dr. Vinay Prasad, and he's constantly bashing clinical trials because he feels that the you know, placebo group or the comparator group is essentially malpractice. Obviously, I'm not an expert in that area, uh, so it's hard for me to comment on it. But certainly, if I felt that one of the groups was totally inappropriate for a given patient, I wouldn't recommend they enter the trial. Simple as that. This next question by Ichabod13 also relates to our trial design, but I, I think it's an opportunity just to clarify the way that we construct trials. So my other question would be along the lines of knowledge of the patient with drugs. If me or others know about Rebif and, and the other beta serums and Copaxone, and we're handed a box of shots to inject every other day, we'd probably assume that we're not on the new drug. What could lead to potential low, this could lead to potential low morale. So let me just tackle this quickly if it's all right. Um, you're absolutely right. If we flipped a coin and handed one patient a shot and the other patient an infusion, it wouldn't be blinded. Everybody would realize what's going on. And, so, and that's, and Ichabod said it perfectly, it biases the trial because now I have an expectation for good or bad potentially, and now the patient has the same um, biased expectation. So what we do, I think, is pretty clever. In this, and we'll use the OPERA trial since um, we're kind of referencing it in this question, and, and both Dr. Bieber and I, we, we did this, right? Um, everybody in the trial, all the patients took a shot thrice weekly, and all the patients in the trial got an IV in the arm twice a year. Half the people, the IV was real ocrelizumab and the shot was a dummy drug. It was not real. The other half, the, the infusion was fake. It was water and the shot was real. And so that's called a double dummy, double blind. And it's a very powerful design. And at the end of the trial, they do a verification and it's, it, it's, found, find, it's found to work. And this is a good way to remove bias. Uh, Dr. Bieber, any comments? Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's, that's the way it should be done. And the, interestingly, in the Tecvidera versus Copaxone trial, they didn't do that. There wasn't a double dummy. So a lot of people criticized that. And yep. they did that just because they didn't need the active comparator for the FDA. They only needed it for the EMA. Um, and then the other problem that I thought that they were getting at is the idea of like unblinding side effects. Where, you know, for a drug like Lemtrada, you know, people tend to have infusion reactions, even if they're not severe, obviously, you know, you're not getting saline if you have a reaction. And so it can unblind people. And that's one of the problems with randomized trials. Uh, so, you know, we do have our difficulties, but we do the best we can by doing like a randomized double dummy trial. Uh, a a uh, anecdotal experience when I was a fellow, I'm going to date myself. Um, I was a blinded evaluator for CARMS1 very early on. <laughs> and this was when I was working in Detroit. It was summer, it was hot, and a young lady came in for the trial, um, and I was the blinded evaluator. And I come in to see her, and she's wearing a short sleeves, and they've put gauze from her neck and then all down her arm, presumably to cover up the infusion reaction. Um, <laughs> and so I tried not to pay attention, did my exam, and got out of there. Yeah, I, I, I was in the same trial, and I had a patient who had disseminated shingles, you know, and I was the blinded evaluator. So it's like, well, what do you think she's getting Lemtrada or not? Come on. That's, that's exactly right. Sometimes it's a little hard. Certain elements of the trial are hardwired. You can't, you know, the, the MRI remains blinded. This next question I view as an ethical question, and it has to do with aging and MS. And this is written by Jim, who says, aging with MS is a subject not talked enough about. Should we stay on our medications? Any special considerations? And uh, Dr. Bieber and I are acutely aware this is a raging topic amongst MS neurologists uh, today in the United States. Well, yeah, I think you made your uh, opinion very clear in your videos. I'm more agnostic. You know, unfortunately, we don't have great evidence for older people. A lot of clinical trials exclude people over age 55. And, you know, part of the reason for that is just people want to make their drug look good. You know, if you give it to older people, they get other diseases unrelated to the drug, you know, and they don't want people to drop out of the trial, that kind of thing. I'm actually against that. I think they should be forced to include people up to at least age 65 or 70, just because so many people with MS are older and we have to know, you know, how effective and safe are the drugs. So we don't know for sure. People have done studies on stopping drugs and the, you know, the evidence, 
evidence suggests that if people are younger, definitely a decent number of people have relapses, even if you know they've had been stable for a long time. As people get older, you know, there is naturally a lower risk of relapses and new MRI lesions. So that's sort of the logic behind this. You know, maybe the drugs are less effective. There is some evidence of that, but we don't really know for sure. There's an ongoing study called Disco MS run by Dr. John Corboy in Colorado. It's going to be finished in 2023. So we may get some actual data. You know, right now it's not really known. You know, I would definitely try to be more conservative if I think someone is like higher risk of getting infections and things like that. I wouldn't necessarily say there's like a specific age at which you can't stop medication. I would definitely feel much more comfortable with someone not taking medication if they're older, they've been stable for a long time, they haven't had new MRI lesions for a long time, but I don't think there's a definitive answer. You're right. Uh, I have a pretty strong opinion, and I'll even throw a link up to that inflammatory video I made in case folks listening want to check it out. I will say, I hope that MS neurologists might embrace the concept of de-escalation, which kind of you kind of just spoke to. Biologically, our immune systems quiet down as we get older. Our risks of uh, attack decrease, although the risk of recovery decreases. And there's a risk of progression in, in, in accelerated brain volume loss. And our medicines work on those areas. And I think to take away those medicines, that's where I'm more concerned really about like so-called the second half of the disease. But I think we can still address those concerns by de-escalating the therapy. So we might not uh, want to use a heavy-hitting B-cell depleter for the lifetime of the human. I could en envision de-escalating to leflunamide, um, you know, and using a Rava uh, off-label or using a ter terflutamide. I was thinking about your recent video. Oh, oh yeah, thank oh. you. I appreciate that. <laughs> what, what do you think? Do you do that at all, or would you consider that? Yeah, sometimes. And you know, I think that we are kind of missing something. You know, I think that we do need better treatments for older people. Uh, it's hard for me to say what we need. You know, maybe Professor Gavin Giovannoni is right, and there's a smoldering inflammation that's driven by the innate immune system, and maybe these gluten tyrosine kinase inhibitors, mesitinib, will be great drugs for older people with MS. I'm hoping. You know, I don't know. Maybe it's all about mitochondrial function and, you know, pre preserving the function of the neurons, even if they're damaged to the axon, and maybe it's all about nutrition or mitochondrial supplements. We don't really know. I do think we're missing something, uh, unfortunately. And probably we're, we may be missing a couple things. I mean, really, if you think about the 25 different formulations of disease modifying therapies that we've worked so hard to bring to market and make available to humans, they're all flavors of anti-inflammation. I mean, and, and they're not, and, and they're really just manipulating mostly the cellular adaptive response and now a little bit of the humoral, but there's vast portions of the immune response that we don't know a lot about, let alone know how to manipulate. I mean, that's why these BTK inhibitors sound so attractive to me that if we can get a hold and, uh, and start to manipulate microglia, I'm not saying that's a panacea or going to fix things. I'm just excited to work on a different aspect of the immune response. And I, th I think they seem to be safer, you know, than B cell depleters, this class of medications, at least preliminarily. We'll see what happens in people with MS, but at least preliminarily. You're right. Um, I'm, I'm doing several of those trials right now at my center. And one of the reasons I felt comfortable launching a clinical trial with an experimental therapy during a global viral pandemic was because those molecules seem really safe from an infection standpoint. Uh, Crawley writes in, do you know of any supplements that can help with any specific symptoms? Well, so, you know, some of the supplements for MS in general, which may not be the question being asked, you know, I would recommend vitamin D just because there's a clear link between prognosis of MS and low vitamin D. Yep. I think there's some evidence for uh, omega-3 fatty acid supplements such as fish oil or flaxseed oil. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the holism study done by Professor George Jelinek suggests that flaxseed oil may be beneficial. There's a randomized trial on fish oil. For supplements off the top of my head, um, sometimes I've recommended alpha-lipoic acid for nerve pain, although it's best studied in diabetics. People have reported that threonine could be beneficial in spasticity. Same with magnesium. Um, those are just some examples. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's interesting that we're very similar. Um, you know, I think that vitamin D supplementation, D3 supplementation is my preference as a mainstay. And, and I think that it doesn't hurt an adult to take a multivitamin. Um, I, I would prefer that we get our vitamins and minerals from, from food options, but if we can add a multivitamin in to the American diet, I feel a little bit better. Beyond that, um, I've recommended at times levocarnitine for some of its data supporting uh, increased energy levels. Um, I've, I, I really increasingly am excited about probiotics for gut health. 
And I found that by adding probiotics into the mix, pun intended, um, I, I, there's a lot less di- uh, constipation in my patients. And so that's one that I've been recommending. Magnesium for spasticity is one that comes up a lot. You reference um, the overcoming MS uh, diet uh, a little bit, uh, and you've done a great video. I learned a lot uh, summarizing several MS diets. So if uh, when, when I talk to patients in clinic, I actually refer them to your videos on that topic uh, to up their game. And so thank you for making this. No problem. Yeah, just a conflict of interest. I do know Professor Jelinek, but he's definitely not paying me, so... <laughs> Fair, fair. Uh, One last question. Um, This is by uh, Mike, who writes, two years with MS, how important is getting my second set of MRIs? Well, I mean, me personally, I often do like an MRI scan six months after the initial one, just to kind of make sure we're going in the right direction. Um, You know, that's just my personal style of practice. Like ongoing, you know, I'll often do them once a year. Uh, And then, you know, if someone's on like a high efficacy medication, you know, and is stable, I'll often do them less often, like every other year, just because their likelihood of getting new MRI lesions are low. The main MRI I would do for screening is the MRI of the brain, but periodically I would do MRI scans of the spine, but it's kind of less likely to get asymptomatic lesions in the spine. Very, very similar. So I like to get a six month rebaseline MRI after starting any new disease modifying therapy to kind of call into scripture where we're starting from. And then if it's stable, I do an annual brain and I typically do it every two or three years C-spine. And then at the age of 60, I start to back off the frequency and we might do them less often. Um, I love the the questions that we get on these live streams. And Dr. Bieber, thank you for jumping on with me and answering them. Great to talk to you as always. Before we jump off, tell everyone a little bit about you and your YouTube channel because anyone listening who doesn't know you or doesn't follow you needs to right away. So give them a little uh, little insight into what you do online. Uh, Well, so I make videos about, you know, multiple sclerosis to inform people. If you have any video suggestions, you could post them in the comments below and I'll definitely take it out. I keep a running list and I usually publish on Wednesdays. I'm interested in like lifestyle and nutrition and sort of recent publications and things like that. So if you have a suggestion, let me know and I'll I'll make a note of it. That's awesome. And um, I hope people take you up on it because I look forward to your videos every week. Uh, My name is Aaron Boster, and as always, thank you for learning about MS with me and with Dr. Bieber. And until our next live stream, our next video, I'm on Monday, he's on Wednesday, or the next time we see you in our respective clinics, be safe and take care.